this is the punchline. A microbiologist called Karim Nayernia of the North East England Stem Cell Institute recently took a step towards rendering men obsolete. By immersing stem cells harvested from men's bone marrow in a cocktail of chemicals that mimic the environment of the testes, Nayernia and his team turned the stem cells into immature sperm. The experiment marks the first time that any non-productive human tissue has been transformed into gametes. If the cells can be grown into mature sperm, the technique could enable women to have a biological child with two mothers, no father. Weirder still, a woman could conceivably use sperm made from her own bone marrow to inseminate her own eggs. Guys, And fellas, fellas, aside from the human species and, I don't know, a couple of isolated uh, occurrences in the animal kingdom, the fate of the male in creation is not worth discussing. <laughs> you have no idea how prevalent sexual cannibalism is in nature. Maybe we'll do something about that next year. So, uh, in introducing this idea, I am introducing our next speaker, John Harris. Uh, uh, and, and uh, well, jo John's in some ways perhaps the most revolutionary speaker we're going to have up here. How are you, John? Great He's come all the way from England because uh, he has some ideas about the permissibility of the perfectibility of man, perhaps even all the way to non-male reproduction. John? Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here at this wonderful meeting. I'm a philosopher, which means I know nothing about anything. I'm one of the parasites of the academic world. I look at what other people are doing, and I try to make judgments about it. There's a, uh, a, a joke about American bioethicists, which, uh, which goes something like this. Uh, the analogy is the mother says to her daughter, go and see what your little brother is doing and tell him to stop. <laughs> bioethicists are the people who are supposed to go and see what scientists are doing and tell them to stop. I'm another sort of bioethicist. I like to go and see what scientists are doing and say, great work, guys. Keep going. Marx said, but it might have been Plato, the purpose of philosophy is not simply to understand the world, but to change it. Now, I believe in changing the world, hopefully for the better. This, uh, I think I was invited here because I published this book called Enhancing Evolution uh, at the end of 2007. And that is the only visual aid that I will be using today <laughs> that was not familiar to Plato. Audi uh, conference organizers or meeting organizers are very nervous about the sort of familiar uh, aids that were familiar to Plato. Those of you who've read your Plato will know that uh, Plato favored a very dramatic visual aid. It was a cave with a very large fire burning in it, which projected uh, shadows onto a wall. People don't like those sorts of uh, visual aids, so uh, <laughs> I like to be true to philosophy and avoid them. What I want to do for the rest of my uh, brief chat with you today is talk about human enhancement, about not only the desirability, not only the ethical imperatives to make ourselves better, but the absolute necessity of doing so. Many speakers in this wonderful meeting have used phrases like what it is to be human and have talked about human nature. In her moving and inspiring presentation, Laura Archer emphasized many times that we are all human. Unfortunately, in the future, possibly the far future, but maybe not, there will be no more human beings. In the future, it is a dead cert that there will be no more human beings. I believe that this is not one of the things that we need to worry about. And I'm hopefully in what I say, whoops, I shall try to explain why. 
And the reason we don't have to worry about this, interestingly, was also contained in Laura Archer's presentation. She said, and I'm sure anybody who heard it will remember, we need to change the world. That's why we're here. Well, yes, we do. But in order to change the world, we will have to change ourselves. Evolution has left us with a very mixed constitution. Some of it's good, some of it isn't. It's left us the wonderful, intelligent, interesting people that have been talking at this meeting. But it's left us vulnerable in all sorts of ways to disease, to injury, and to premature death. If we're to survive, or if our descendants are to survive, we need to change that. Suppose a school or a university advertised itself as setting out to improve the intelligence of the students that attended. And not only to be able, through their dramatic new curriculum, to improve on the intelligence, the cognitive powers of their students, but also to make them healthier, more physically fit, and uh, brighter, better in every way than any, than any educational institution before. What would we think? Well, we'd be amazed, and we wouldn't believe it for a moment. But suppose they further claim that not only could they do better than any other educational institution, but they could produce brighter, healthier kids, young adults, than any previously in history. Well, we would be skeptical, but if our skepticism was unfounded, would we want our children to go to such an institution? Well, I would. But much more likely, of course, because we know what an inefficient way of getting anything into another human being education is, much more likely the sorts of enhancements I'm talking about, enhancements in cognitive abilities, in health, in longevity, they're likely to come about in a whole range of different sorts of ways, through medicine, through drugs, through genetic interventions, and so on. Now, many people are very, not only skeptical, very hostile to the idea of tinkering with human nature in order to achieve better results than the wonderful results that inhabit, that populate this room. I think that that skepticism is unfounded. And in the time remaining, I just want to canter through a few of the ways um, that enhancements might occur and to say why we shouldn't be hostile to them. The first and most obvious is something that we might call mechanical or technological enhancement. The most obvious example, but there are many, is written language. Written language is a powerful human enhancer. It enabled recorded history to begin. It enabled us to communicate it in unprecedented ways. It was a very powerful technology, and it was an enhancing technology. In the college that I went to in Oxford, um, when it was founded in 1268, literacy was rare. The clerks, the religious uh, young men, men only in those days, who attended Balliol College in 1268, um, were literate. And they were not the elite. The elite were the barons who were largely illiterate. Now, literacy is almost universal in the world. And it has been a huge blessing. Take another piece of mechanical enhancement. How many of you, like me, use this wonderful little enhancer here? These are, these are reading glasses. Uh, men of my age need reading glasses because it is species typical of us to have that sort of sight defect. Now, you might say, well, this isn't an enhancement technology. This is a therapeutic device. This is not there to improve upon normal species functioning. It's there to correct a defect. OK, maybe. Now think about binoculars or telescopes or microscopes. They're not there to improve upon normal species functioning or species typical functioning. They're there to enhance it, and they do. So 
if you think that there is some sort of moral divide between therapy and enhancement, between repairing dysfunction and enhancing function, you might be okay with specs, but you would draw the line at binoculars and microscopes. And England's wonderful, the famous naval hero, Horatio Nelson, uh, the explanation of his putting in the telescope to his blind eye at the Battle of Copenhagen would not be so that he had an excuse for ignoring the orders of his commanding officer, but rather to avoid the moral turpitude of availing himself of an enhancement technology. One more example of a wonderful enhancement technology that we're all using at this moment. We are bathed in it. It is synthetic sunshine. We are bathed at this moment. We can have this meeting because of synthetic sunshine. Very old technology, very handy. First firelight, candlelight, lamplight, and other forms of synthetic sunshine allowed many things to be possible. Before synthetic sunshine, when it got dark, we slept. When it got light, we got up and did stuff. With the advent of synthetic sunshine, both work and play could continue into the night, and those who could avail themselves of that enhancement technology could steal a march on their fellows by working and doing things that others were not able to do. So the point of all this is that we are inveterate self-improvers, enhancers. We do it all the time. Now consider biological sorts of enhancement. A step further, if you like. Vaccines, we think of them as a therapy, but they're not. It is species typical of our species to be vulnerable to smallpox, to polio, to measles, mumps, and rubella, and many other things that we now have vaccines for. Vaccines do not restore species typical functioning. They enhance it. But we don't object to them on that account. Now think of something else. Think of the advent of regenerative medicine, securing the regenerative powers probably of stem cells to enable tissue to actually repair itself in situ. Um, a friend of mine who works on uh, aging was very fond of saying, we humans do not die of old age, we die of the diseases of old age. Postulate that we could systematically treat effectively the diseases of old age, and there is in principle no reason why we should die. We could, in theory, and possibly in fact, live forever. Would that be a good thing? Well, I'd certainly uh, be happy to sample a few million years and see how it goes. I'm not in a hurry to, uh, to pop my clogs. But of course, it would be a dramatic change. We tend to, we, one of the traditional ways of defining humans is as mortals, to distinguish ourselves from the immortals, the gods and the fairies and so forth, that don't die. If we could change our mortality, we would be change, making a very important species change. I've just time to mention quickly chemical cognitive enhancers, things like uh, Ritalin, Modafinil. You may have heard of these uh, group that I um, was involved in. We published a paper in Nature in December last year about the use of and advocating serious thought be given to the use of chemical cognitive enhancers in the healthy. These drugs were developed uh, for use with people uh, who, for example, have ADHD and so forth but they're very widely and covertly in use by students. And uh, it seems to me there are very good reasons to think about extending that use. And finally, what about tinkering with the genes? What about making genetic interventions? What about really getting to our genetic heritage, as um, UNESCO wonderfully and cavalierly defined it? Is, there, is that a step too far? Should we leave the human genome alone? And as, in, again, in the wonderful words of UNESCO, preserve it as the common heritage of humanity. Interestingly, UNESCO used that phrase when objecting to human cloning. And if they thought about it, which they didn't, because they're a very unthoughtful sort of group, they would realize, actually, that human cloning is the only way to preserve the human genome. Everything else, including sexual reproduction, modifies it. So if you're really interested in preserving the human genome, what you've got to do is use cloning as not only your preferred, 
but your only method of human reproduction. I was at a marvelous meeting on stem cells a long time ago now, 2003 in Singapore, and I heard a presentation by David Baltimore, many of you will know his name, Nobel Prize winning scientist, president of Caltech, and he was describing work in his lab to create unprecedented cells that had never been in a human organism before and use them, uh, and the power of these cells would, he hoped, be able to make us immune to, or at least resistant to, cancer and to HIV AIDS. This work has not come to fruition, it's still ongoing. But a very interesting question is, should we wish him well or should we wish him ill? It seems to me that the rational person would wish him well, would want this work to be successful. But if it is, it will involve changes in the human genome. Genetic changes which will make us different, or our successors different to any other humans that have ever lived. I want to end by uh, repeating uh, a story that uh, many of you will be familiar with. It uh, occurred in one of um, Richard Dawkins' wonderful essays called Gaps in the Mind. And it's a rather long-winded way of uh, teaching a number of lessons which I think will sum up what I'm trying to say to you today. He asks us to imagine a contemporary human woman standing, there's the sea, you're the sea, I'm standing on the coast, this woman is standing on the coast of Africa, looking north towards Europe, as she would. And in her right hand, she is holding her mother's hand, contemporary human woman. And her mother, in her right hand, is holding her mother's hand, and so on, into Africa. Each mother takes up about a yard, a meter of space, as she holds uh, her mother's hand in turn. In just 300 miles into Africa, not very far, you'd hardly notice it on the map, you will come to our common ape ancestor between five and seven million years ago. And our common ape ancestor, they're all women, makes it genetically convenient, as well as uh, restoring uh, the imbalance of justice that we heard about earlier today. Our common ape ancestor is holding in her other hand her daughter, and so on back to the coast in a human chain. And when you get back to the coast, our contemporary human woman is standing facing a contemporary chimpanzee, contemporary female chimpanzee, which are also descended in a seamless line from our common ape ancestor. Now, I am informed that without the aid of technology, we can't mate with chimpanzees, and one of the ways of defining a species is in terms of uh, the capacity to successful, successfully mate with other members of the species. But of course, now we have the technology to correct that, and we can reproduce with uh, chimpanzees if we choose. But the point is that our status as a species, as a separate species, is an accident of evolution. There were apes elsewhere in the chain that have now died out, that our ancestors could have and undoubtedly did mate with. Now, what is the point of this story? Well, there are many points. It reminds us of the seamlessness of change, that we often think of ourselves as distinct from animals. And in recent discussions about the ethics of producing hybrid animal-human embryos and possibly hybrid animal-human creatures, great exception was taken to the idea of mixing species in that way. But of course, we are ourselves human animals. We are ourselves a mixture of a whole range of species, not just stopping at our ape ancestor, but going right back to the very first monocellular creatures that existed on the Earth. But another point of this story is, why should we now block the further evolution of our species? It may take another five to seven million years for it to happen through Darwinian evolution, but as I tried to describe, the book's gone. I'd like to have waved it at you again. But as I would like to have uh, and pointed and did describe in the book, it's much more likely that if there is to be further evolution of our species, it will take place through the deliberate, conscious choices that we make about how to change ourselves. Many people think that we shouldn't do that. Thank you. Many people think that we shouldn't do that, that it's dangerous. But my suggestion is that it would be more dangerous not to, that we need to correct many of our 
vulnerabilities. Suppose our ape ancestors, seven million years and just 300 miles back into Africa, had got together and said, simian nature guys, absolutely fantastic. Let's, let's not mess with it. Let's bring down a curtain here and make sure that there is no further evolution, that this species lives forever and in a changeless way. Well, if that had happened, we wouldn't have been having this agreeable conversation that we've had today. I'm pleased that it didn't happen, and I don't want to foreclose a possible future that may, and I believe necessarily will, result in our eventually being replaced by our descendants, who will not be human, but will have evolved from us by our deliberate reproductive choices and decisions in the same way that we have evolved from apes. And finally, not only do we need to be replaced as a species, we're going to need a new habitat as well, because we know that the Earth is not going to last forever, and that's also a certainty. So we need to face and start thinking about now two things, how to replace ourselves with better creatures and how to find a better habitat in which to live, because both are absolutely necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay. Yes. This is, of course, an uh, infinitely fascinating discussion. I mean, many people in this room already have robotic devices or enhancers within. Right? I'm sure there are hip replacements in the audience, knee replacements in the audience, implants. I have quite a few. Uh, <laughs> well, when I meet her, I, I'm going to complain to the old creator. Like, these lips, they're fine. They're working well. The earlobes, they're good. Yeah? It's, it's the bones that don't keep up. Have you noticed? I, they're not specked for as long as the rest of us. And, uh, I've got a beef about that. But the point I'm trying to make is there are some enhancers that achieve a level of acceptability, and there are others that make us recoil. And even things that made us recoil 20 years ago, like artificial insemination, test tube babies, find a measure of acceptance. But you say the word eugenics, and, you know, Nazi lunatics kind of spring to mind, and... So how are you going to bridge that gap? Well, eugenics is just the attempt to make fine, healthy children. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, that's how you will define it. Now, of course, there are different ways of going about that, and the Nazis chose a rather unpleasant way of going about it, and that is by trying to kill off existing people. But if we go about it actually by making choices about future people, uh, just as we do, in fact, now, we make choices about what sort of future people there will be by our choice of procreational partner. If we go about eugenics in that way, it seems to me to be harmless. The specter of the Nazis is always raised, but mostly inappropriately. And uh, what the Nazis did wrong was, uh, was kill people. We're not going to do that, I hope. <laughs> Last question. What do you make of the possibility of women doing without men, or at least females not requiring males? Uh, well, um, I mean... <laughs> You're, you're, I, I, you're a rare guy who's positive I, I, on just about anything that can make things better. I, I have written about that. It's actually in my book called The Value of Life, which is uh, still in print. Um, it's certainly possible, and as long as it's done, as it were, for future generations and not by killing existing men. <laughs> and, and, and on the hypothesis that we are all genuinely equal, in fact, that there is nothing to choose from the moral point of view, between men and women, then it seems to me that um, there is no harm in it, necessarily. Now, of course, it would be undesirable from the male perspective, but <laughs> this technology already exists. We know that, in principle, we can make sperm out of fibroblasts, out of uh, skin cells. Uh, we can make male or female sperm, in principle. There are some practical difficulties which I could go into but from the skin cells of either men or women. They can make either male or female sperm. So in principle, we will be able to, uh, uh, to be mother and father to our own offspring in the future of either gender. Quite Won't that be fun? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Thank a lot, you. John. <laughs>